Hi, this is the old master bather, Scott Bradfield, and that's Dodo the Dodo the, the passenger pigeon or the, the, the parakeet. And that, yeah, thank you, Dodo. And we're we're doing sec part two of a of a, my rambling monologue about my old friend Gus Hosford. I've been meaning to do these in the doing something about him, but it, you know, I had a really pretty long relationship with Gus, who I, I loved and he found very difficult. But he was he was both a fascinating guy, a very funny guy, and a very very difficult sometimes creepy guy sometimes. Anyway, the the weirdest part about him and the most notorious was his his love for stealing library books, and he would steal them from all over the world. And I just wanted to kind of go on because this this is one of my this is one of the most fascinating stories to me. I, I find it kind of fascinating for many reasons. So Gus had been stealing from library books all over the libraries all over the world. Not just, but a lot from the Santa Monica Public Library and from San Luis. He was stealing from Cal Poly. I talked to somebody up in Cal Poly who knew about him for stealing up there when he lived in San Luis Obispo. And again, he went to the British Museum. He stole books from the British Museum, British Library, um, all and from all sorts of uh, libraries. And sometimes he would get order. They would order. He would ask the library to send him the books, and they would send it to him. And he wouldn't. He would just keep it. He would keep it all the time. He he he. Uh, there's a lot of other things I won't say because I think this is all public. I know a lot. Of, I know a lot of where a lot of bodies are buried in Gus's life. And I won't go into any of the others except the library books. But anyway, so he'd written the short timers, and he was traveling all over the world. And eventually he, he went to uh, London. When I was in London, he came through to work on the script for Stanley Kubrick's short, uh, Full Metal Jacket. And, they were, and he told stories about how obsessive Kubrick was and how, fat, how obsessive he was about every shot. And they were talking for years before they started filming about every detail, such as how they cut the kid's hair at the very beginning. They talked about this for nights, one night after another, because Kubrick was obsessed with getting the visuals just right. And and eventually he wrote the movie. And it came out, and it had some pretty good success. I don't know how successful it was when it came out. I was a little disappointed. I, I still think that's my least favorite Kubrick film for a lot of reasons, but uh, um, it was still an interesting movie. And so uh, Gus had the movie come out, and just about the time the book came out, they started. They ran an article by a, a mutual friend of of, of Gus and mine. Um, Named, uh, oh my God, I forgot his name now. This just shows you how um, it'll come to me. Um, an old, an old writer had worked for. Uh, he'd worked for. Um, um, all, all he, he was a fairly successful journalist, a literary journalist, and he uh, he did a piece for the Los Angeles Reader or the Los Angeles Weekly. I can't remember. Really, a long piece on Gus, and the Los Angeles Times did a piece that like two picture. Two, two pictorials about this kind of local boy because Gus had spent a large part of his life living in, in Los Angeles and pictures of him. And in one of these pieces, the photographer went up to San Luis Obispo with Gus and took pictures of his, he had this huge storage uh, unit in uh, on ta off Tank Farm Road, just packed with books, many of them stolen from libraries. And they went in and took a pictures of it and showed pictures of Gus and his, his famous collection of books and uh, in the in the course of it, the, the article came out, and the movie was coming out, and Gus was actually nominated for an Academy Award for the screenplay for for Full Metal Jacket. For all th there were three. It was credited to him, Michael Hare, and uh, and Kubrick, and and according to Gus, I sort of I believe him. He did the whole script. I'm sure he did. Anyway, he was nominated for that, and they had this article come out, and then as this this pictures come out with pictures of Gus's library, his his private library. A librarian. This is the story that, that I got passed on, passed on to me by a mutual friend. A librarian at the Santa Monica Public Library saw this picture and said, "Hosford, Hosford, I recognize that name." And he looked up on their computer or whatever they had, whatever database they had in the in the early '80s, and uh, found out that there were like dozens and dozens of books checked out to this guy that had never been returned. He was he'd stolen all these library books. So eventually he starts investigating and somehow it gets connected and somewhere along the line the FBI gets involved because they find out that he's been stealing the books from all over the world. Now I didn't know Gus at this time. I have to say there was a there was a there was a very that was probably the the one time Gus and I were not at all friends. I mean he was he got really upset about the library scan, the library deal coming out and and he was very upset. He I remember him writing me letters saying, you know, you you I had 
I still have them somewhere. You know, I had the right to steal those books because no one else wanted them. And, and I, I wouldn't say what he wanted me to tell him, which was it was okay what you did. And he got kind of mad at me, and I didn't hear from him for most for about a year or two while he was going through this. And I wasn't, you know, I, I'd known he'd done it, and I was, but he was getting, he was mad at me, not about that. He was not mad because I didn't say it was okay to do what he did. I, that's how I read it. Anyway, he's, uh, he's the FBI gets involved, and I read an article in the the Guardian newspaper, and this is <clears throat> this is my picture of the FBI, how they how they operate. And there's a journalist went and found Gus. He was living in San Clemente then. He was always living in places where I had lived before. I had lived in San Clemente, and suddenly he was in San Clemente. And the journalist went and found him there, and told him, "As well, you know, the FBI says they're gonna they're gonna look they're looking for you." And 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 someone has asked the FBI how they're gonna catch you. Gus was like not he was just wasn't hiding. He was just like living his life. And the FBI said, "Well, he's nominated for the Academy Award. We're gonna wait outside the Academy." When he shows up to pick to be for to arrive at the see if he wins the Academy Award, he's gonna we're gonna wait for him there. And Gus said, "Well, you know, I don't think I'm going to the Academy Awards this year." That was his. <laughs> and of course, the FBI. So I guess the FBI had no idea how to catch a person unless they were nominated for the Academy Award. That's how I always remember that story. Anyway, Gus was eventually caught, and again, I hadn't I didn't talk to him until after he got out. But then he went to. Uh, he went, actually went to prison. He got caught. He came to San Luis Obispo. And I think he did six months. Somebody can probably correct me. I think he had some mutual friends. Our friend Bruce knew him. And, and I think he did six months on stolen library books. And he might have got out early. I don't know. Um, but anyway, he's like the only person possibly in the history of the world that anyone I know knows who actually went to jail for stealing library books. And that was Gus for stealing so many of them. Anyway, um, I, I didn't hear from Gus again after that. We've been pretty good friends up till then. And then when he came out, I started hearing from him again a little bit. And then uh, we were sort of corresponding as normal. And then uh, um, he he went to, uh, he, he was getting really unhealthy because he was eating nothing but crap. I mean, he literally, I'm sure he spent his whole life eating at McDonald's every day in the Sizzler at, at dinner. And he was getting really heavy, overweight. He drank tons of beer. And again, the story I heard from a mutual friend is he went to Greece and he he was di- he was diagnosed with diabetes refused to go to the doctor he would never go, that's another thing about this he would never go to doctors or dentists i mean teeth would rot out of his mouth he would not go to a dentist and he would never go to the doctor and he never had himself treated for diabetes and he eventually went to greece and the story i was told is he just he locked himself up in his <coughs> in his boat his little place and he just died died of, died of diabetes anyway that's a sad ending but um i have to say i, I the only time, you know, there's this still, those silly plots like murder mysteries where people fake their own deaths so that they can get away from the police and everything. I, the only person I know in my life who might actually try to fake his own death would be Gus. So, Gus, if you're still out there, I often still in the back of my mind think, you know, I bet the bastard just faked it. I bet he did. He buried some old lady in his grave. But I don't. I, that's probably not true. Anyway, so he did Full Metal Jacket. And then he did, when I knew him, he did. He was working on two books. Actually, I knew him when he was writing all these books. He was working on two books endlessly for like ten years. One was called A Gypsy Good Time. I'm, I don't think I've ever seen a copy of this except the one I've got, which I bought when it came out, and I knew Gus when this came out. And it was his attempt to write a, a detective novel. The character's name is Dowdy Lewis, who was named after two friends. Grover Lewis was the guy who wrote the article. My, it's just my senility. Grover Lewis was a terrific old guy and a, and a great writer and a journalist. And uh, Andy Dowdy was a friend I had introduced Gus to who was a book dealer. And he had a great place called Other Times Books. And Gus and, and Grover and them, they all got, they all made, they, they became big buddies long after I, and then I moved out of, I moved out of the area, but they saw each other quite regularly and, and uh, were very close. And anyway, it's a, it's a book. It's his attempt. It's well. It's actually a fairly successful attempt to write a detective novel. It's weird, like everything of Gus's, but some he wrote really good prose. He he worked incredibly hard on his on his paragraphs and his sentences. And there's some really really amazing, beautiful paragraphs. It's going to be a hard book to find. And then he wrote a sequel. He was writing this for years, and I could have sworn it was never it was going to never be any good. And he wrote a sequel called The Phantom Blooper, which is a sequel. To the short timers, where Joker, actually Joker, Joker joins the Viet Cong. 
Gus, that's really, Gus, just because Gus was totally, he was very anti-American, America's involvement in the, in Vietnam, and he was he was much more sympathetic towards the Viet Cong, and, and Joker goes to, to, to live with the Viet Cong in one large section of the book. I haven't read it since it came out, but I actually think his second and third books are better written, and actually better books than the most famous one, The Short Timers. All three are incredibly hard to find. So anyway, that's, I think those are the most uh, the most there, there was just so much about Gus and and uh, that that was so unforgettable and he was such a character. Um, oh, this is he was always sending stuff. I still keep this. I keep this to remember Gus. I don't have any photos from uh, I don't have any photos from my youth. I don't think uh, he he sent me this William Faulkner stamp because he knew I loved William Faulkner. So I keep that around here on the shelf just to remind me of William Faulkner and Gus and. Uh, Anyway, that's that's the whole story. This is a two two parter. It, it's uh, I hope it wasn't too much of a waste of time, and it was very, as you can tell, totally unprepared. But uh, you, he's a writer who should be remembered, and not simply because of, of the movie, because I think his books are actually more interesting than the movie, and they're all out of print. They've been out of print for a long time, and they're, they're exorbitant. I mean, to sell the books, I mean, even the paperback. I will say this for you book dealers out there. You book uh, people like to collect books, rare books. So I got mine signed. I had all my books signed by Gus when I knew him. But the problem was he was always running out of them. He, he, he and I was always have to give it to him. So then he would sign it again, and give me another copy. <laughs> I can't. Every time I had books of his, he would take them and give because he wanted to give them to friends or usually girls he wanted to go out with, and the paperbacks. Any paperback version of the short timers in the old Bantam edition are, are, are being listed on, on eBay for like hundreds and hundreds of dollars. I mean, it's got to be one of the most valuable books I've ever seen listed on eBay or in a, a books. So you see anything by Gus. And I, I haven't seen any of these less than several hundred dollars. Um, he, he's worth reading. I don't know if he, I, he's probably not even on Kindle. Maybe your local library will have him. Um, particularly if you're interested in kind of Vietnam War literature, he was really sort of the first first writer to get to get a significant uh, book and a movie about that uh, terrible American adventure. All right, all right. Happy bathing. Uh, that's the end of this, this pointless adventure, and we hope that hope that we ho only hope it was pointless and meaningless to you as it was to us. Happy bathing.